was like, no, don't. Everybody, let's stand, let's worship, let's tell God how much we love Him. Let's unite in what we believe this morning by this song. I believe in the blood of Jesus, the wash is white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes the broken whole i believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away the stone i believe i believe i believe as we bow before you
Father. Thank you, Lord, that we get to live here. We get to worship together here. Thank you that you hear us when we come to you, Lord, and that you answer our prayers, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together.
All right, you can be seated. We'll get back up and we'll worship some more at the end of our message during our response time today. But I just want to welcome you all today to Silver Creek Fellowship. It is so, so good to be gathered here together today. This will be a great time during our service for you to pull out your connection card uh, and fill this out for us. Don't forget, the backside does have a spot for your prayer requests and your answers to prayer. And we've got bins in the back that you can drop these cards in on your way out today. Those are the same bins that if you came prepared today to give tithes or offerings in person, you can drop those in those bins in the back. Of course, you can also give online in a whole bunch of different ways. Barrett is bringing that slide up for me right now. Perfect. You can text in, you can go to our app, you can actually uh, go to our website. We have lots of ways for you to, to do this. If you need help with any of that, just stop by the info desk. We would love to give you more information about how you can participate that way at Silver Creek Fellowship. Now, I just have a few announcements I'd like to make. Once again, I I'm just cannot believe these realities, but this week is Thanksgiving. We are, we are there. We are at the holiday season, and part of the holidays is we have lots of stuff, as you all do as well, happening. Our, our calendar really fills up through this holiday season, but it's really good stuff, and I just want you to make sure that on your calendar, with all the other stuff that you're doing, that you do not miss out on some of the things that we're doing together as a church family. One of them is that next Sunday, uh, next Sunday night, which is the 27th at 6 p.m., we are kicking off the Advent season. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, and our tradition has been for many, many, many years on the first Sunday of Advent to have our Advent baked potato uh, feast. So we'll come together. We provide the potatoes and all the toppings. You don't have to bring anything other than yourself. You come, you eat potatoes, enjoy time together, and then one of my favorite things happens. We go outside and you'll get to see the fruit of so many people's labor who came yesterday to our Christmas light uh, setup day and work day. There's more to happen this week on that, but after our potato feast, we'll go outside, we'll sing some Christmas carols, we'll have our Hallmark moment together, we'll light all the Christmas lights on the campus. After the countdown, you'll get to walk around the Christmas village with all of the lights. It'll be a wonderful way for you and your family to kick off the holiday season, to really move now past Thanksgiving and into the Christmas holiday. So I so want to, um, to invite you to come next Sunday night. It's a great event. It'll be so much fun, and we'd love to have you here. Now, what's happening starting next Sunday as we move into Advent is there's lots of other things attached to Advent at Silver Creek Fellowship. One of them is that every year from Thanksgiving to Christmas, we call this whole season of church our season of blessing. Now, during our season of blessing, we have lots of different ways for you, uh, the, the church body, to participate in being a blessing into the local community and all the way to the ends of the earth. So we'll be taking an offering throughout the season of blessing that really goes to the benevolence ministry of this church. We're also going to see throughout the season of blessing, one of the ways you can participate this year is we at uh, our ministry mission of hope has suddenly come up against the reality that we are really low on our food stocks because the need in our community is exponentially rising as a result of expensive groceries and inflation. So we have started giving out more and more food, taking on more and more responsibility, and we need more and more food to fill that need. So we are starting this next week a canned food, a, a dry goods canned food food drive where you can start bringing food into our facility here and all of that food will be distributed to the people here in our community and the surrounding communities. And so I think this is the type of thing that our church is built for. We love our town. We love the people of this community. And any blessing that we have, we want to see passed on 
to people who are in need. On that note, I'm going to ask Heidi um, Adams to come. Heidi leads our mom's next ministry here at Silver Creek Fellowship. And we have just completed the Operation Christmas Child campaign with them. And she's going to tell us quickly about um, some of the results of what we were able to do together. Yep, it's on. first year the title group did it and we did 12 boxes which was wonderful uh, and then last year we partnered with the church oh. and um, we did <laughs> we partnered with the church and we did 103 boxes last year so this year I had a goal I figured we would be able to double that so our goal this year was 200 and Aiden is going to give you the grand total of the boxes that you guys provided this year for us 313 boxes. So then on top of that, we also had people that brought in financial donations. And um, when we pooled all that together, it was almost $700 as well on top of the boxes that everybody provided. So um, and just a little backstory um, on Operation Christmas Child. When a child receives a box, each child will get the story of the gospel in that box. So over 300 little children now will be learning about Jesus because of all that you guys provided for us this year. So we're very thankful, um, and we'll do it again next year. Amen. So thank you, everybody who supported this uh, mission this year. Amen. Thank you. So if doubling... Is what we're going to go by, right? Doubling. That means that our goal for next year is what? 600 now? I'm saying it on the microphone for a reason. We are blessed to be a blessing, right friends? This is what it means to be part of this church family as we see ourselves as people who God is pouring out blessing upon so that we can be a blessing in our community. You'll see lots of other ways you can participate. we got Tree of Giving out there. We have so many ways for you to get involved, for you to get engaged, for you to be a blessing. I think it's just wonderful. I think it is um, the highlight of really leading this church. You just love, love, love your generosity. So now, this week is Thanksgiving week. I was shopping at Safeway this week, and one of the things I noticed is it seems like Safeway and the other stores have forgotten that Thanksgiving is still a holiday. I mean, remember years ago when you would go to the store around this time, there would be little pilgrims and little turkeys, and you would see lots of Thanksgiving decor. That's gone. That's over. Now it's just we go from the big commercial holiday of Halloween where they can sell candy and sell costumes, and the minute that that thing is over, we immediately bring out the Christmas stuff and say, hey, everybody, we got another thing for you to spend your money on. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Christmas. We go big on Christmas here at Silver Creek Fellowship. If you looked as you came in this morning, and there's even more to come, we go big on Christmas. We love Christmas. But I want us to slow down today just a little bit. I want us to be present here together today in this moment. I want us to focus ourselves here for a while, focus our thoughts, focus our hearts, our mind, our soul and focus on gratitude and thanksgiving today to really set our hearts on what God has done for us, on what God has provided us with. And I believe this is actually a habit we need to focus on a lot more. We need to focus a lot more on gratitude and thanksgiving. Because, see, we live in a time in history, friends, where ingratitude 
is on the rise all around us. Complaining and entitlement are our new national pastimes. Social media has just amplified this, right? We just have an avenue where we think everything that I think is wrong in the world, everyone else needs to know about in real time, okay? And it just amplifies this thing of grumbling and complaining. But friends, this is actually nothing new. In fact, this goes all the way back to the very beginning, to the Garden of Eden. I, I love this book called 1,000 Gifts by Anne Voskamp. And in the book, it's really a book about gratitude. And in the book, she says that our problem with ingratitude actually goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. This is how she says it. She says, from all of our beginnings, we keep reliving the Garden story. Satan, he wanted more, more power, more glory. Ultimately, in his essence, Satan was an ingrate, and he sinks his venom into the heart of Eden. Satan, Satan's sin becomes the first sin of all humanity, the sin of ingratitude. Adam and Eve are simply painfully ungrateful for what God gave. Isn't that the catalyst of all of my sin? Our fall was, has always been, and will always be that we aren't satisfied in God and what he gives. And we hunger for something more, something other. You see, from the very beginning, the devil was able to convince mankind that God was actually withholding good things from us, things that we needed, things that we wanted, things that would be tasty, things that would be good, things that would make us happy and wise and powerful. And instead of Adam and Eve looking at the devil and looking around the garden and saying, are you crazy? Look at how good we have it. Look at our perfect bodies. Look at our perfect relationship. Look at all the food God has said we can have and we can eat. Why would we ever go against what God has called good? Instead of that, we go, yeah, maybe he is withholding good from us. You know what? I think there is something better than what God is offering us. See, Paul tells us in Romans 1, verse 20 through 21, he says, for, the, for his, speaking of God's, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he's made so that we're without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, Paul actually says that our ungratefulness towards God, our inability to give thanks to God, is right at the root of the human problem, of the human condition. We don't honor God or give thanks to Him. Now, having just returned from a trip in Africa and Poland, I am convinced that we Christians in America have got to go to war against this epidemic of ungratefulness that surrounds us in our culture. Remember, friends, how do we change a culture? If we all recognize this ingratitude and ungratefulness that surrounds us, how do we do anything about it? Is it by going on our social media and yelling at other people and telling them that they should be more grateful? No. The way we change culture is by us individually living thankful, grace-filled, grateful lives. As we live out with gratitude and gratefulness and thanksgiving, we affect and infect the people around us. As we do that, we become a church that's full of gratitude and thanksgiving. As a church transforms and because a church of gratitude and thanksgiving, we can change our community. As a community is changed, this is how we change. This is the way God has given us, friends. It starts with you and I. Instead of pointing the finger at this is a them problem, which we all have our them, right? We all picture a different them. This is a them problem. No, no, no. This is a me problem. This is something I have to struggle through. One of the things that happened when I was in Africa that has literally shaken me to a core. I have a picture uh, of a hospital room. Can you find that picture? Okay. The man sitting in this bed is the brother of our main connection who you see standing on the right. That's Ferdinand Sengoy. Uh, Sengoy is our rock. He's our right hand. 
He's part of our team here at Silver Creek Fellowship. He is doing amazing things in his country. He pastors the largest evangelical church in the nation of Gabon, and he is a spirit-filled man of God. That is his brother sitting in that hospital bed. And because the nation of Gabon is so corrupt, and because the leaders there are so wicked and vile, this hospital is just built 10 years ago, and it's bankrupt, and so... Every single medicine that you need when you come to the hospital, you have to bring yourself. You you might not have heard me. If you need a hypodermic needle, you have to provide it yourself. Your family has to go out and get, so you'll see there's a little table there that has his medicine stacked on it. Those are the things that a doctor said he needed, and somebody from his family went out and found, procured, and brought back to the hospital. He has waiting to be sent to France to have a surgery that without, he will not live. But he can't get the paperwork needed from his government to leave to have the surgery. So he just waits. Day after day, he waits in this hospital room, hopeless and without any real belief that things could change other than that God would move in the situation. Friends, we experience so many things like this. There's no running water there anywhere. Because the government won't take care of the water system. They're a wealthy government, but they won't provide the water for the people. There's no electricity through much of the day for the same reason. The garbage is piled up in the streets because the people, even though the government is wealthy, they keep it for themselves instead of it piling down and and, and really blessing the people. The corruption, you cannot imagine how deep it is. The the country is is a rich oil country, but instead of the money... Blessing the people, 30% of all of their oil money that the Saudis uh, bring out of the ground gets paid directly as a gift to the president and his family. It is so bad. It is so bad. I can't even put into words the difficulty that the church lives in in this nation of Gabon. But you know what the church is doing? They're thriving. They're seeing people saved. They're beginning to do peace work because they know their government's not going to do it for them. So the church is beginning to do it. And they're seeing areas transformed for the gospel. They're seeing radical movements of God. And they live with thanksgiving and they live with gratitude and they worship beautifully. And I came home thinking, Lord, if we had one of those things, how would we respond? What would we say to the situation and the circumstance? How would we treat each other? What do you think social media would look like? And friends, it's shaken me that I really believe we have to begin to consider these questions. I was speaking with a man in Ukraine. I have a hard time with this story. He lost his wife and three kids to this current war that's going on. And he told me he's now an Uber driver. And he was a mechanical engineer back home. And he said, you don't understand how good you have it. I said, no, I, you're right. And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, because you never have to wonder if everything, including everybody that you love, will be taken away from you when you go to sleep tonight. And even if something terrible happened and they were taken away, you never have to wonder whether something would be done about it. Because he said, in my country, even if we win this war, who can give me back my children? And who can give me back my life? And it just hit me so deeply on how much I have to be thankful for. Coming back to my home and coming back to my uh, house and my family and my country where I put my kids to sleep safe. Where we live in this place where we're allowed to be idiots and jerks on social media. and We don't lose our life for it. Where we can live in freedom and friends. What I want to share with you today is is I really believe we have to go to war against this issue of ingratitude within ourselves. We need to begin to really look ourselves in the mirror and begin to ask ourselves, am I living a life that you could categorize as a thankful life? Or if somebody were to look at my life from afar and journal out what my life was like, would I be more known for grumbling and frustration Or would I be known for thanksgiving? So let's look real quick at Psalm 103. This has been called, Psalm 103 has been called David's Hallelujah Chorus. 
This is a psalm of David. It's a song that David wrote. I'm going to read you the whole thing, and then we're just going to look at a few verses from it this morning, okay? So I'll read you this whole Psalm 103 because it's just wonderful. And then we'll look just at the beginning here together today. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As the father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Before we go any further, let's just pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for so much, God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us right now as we look at this text, and that you would really help us, God, in this issue of ingratitude to be a grateful and thankful people. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want you to see something here in this psalm that I think is really important that we notice right off the top. Who is David talking to specifically in this psalm? David is speaking to his soul. Over and over again, David is speaking to his soul. That might sound a little weird to you, but David is talking to his soul. David is reminding himself of truths that he needs to remember. So Specifically today, I want to focus on what David is telling his soul. I want to focus on the instructions that David is giving his own soul because I think if we'll look at this, this will really help us as we live and attempt to live a grateful, gratitude-filled, thankful life. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat here what I believe is the key to a a thankful life. The key to a life of gratitude is right here at the beginning. And that is that we praise the Lord and consider his benefits. That we praise the Lord and consider his benefits. David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that sits within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Look at how David starts off this psalm. It's a psalm of praise. And notice that there's no requests. There's no petitions. There's no pleas. Now, those are all good things, and David uses those in lots of different psalms. But in this psalm, David is just awestruck with God. He's just pouring out worship and praise to God. He's counting his blessings instead of his burdens, okay? David is intentionally focusing his soul, by speaking to his soul, on the things his soul needs to focus on. And I love this about David. Can you just hear David's praise as this, because remember, this is a song. This is a song that was sung by the Hebrew people for generations and has been turned into songs that we still sing and are going to sing in just a moment on to this day. These songs, remember, how did David worship? What was David's worship like? Does anyone remember? David was known for his enthusiastic and his vibrant worship. In fact, he embarrassed his wife, right? His wife was like, David, 
Stop dancing like that. And David said, no, no, I'm going to be even more undignified than this. David was, was, was a, a person who loved to worship God. And it wasn't just when he went to the temple. David's life was marked by worship. All the way back in his youth, remember, he was a musician who'd play music before King Saul and the evil spirits would leave. David was a man of worship and praise. When you hear in the Bible that David is a man after God's own heart, isn't it interesting that the man after God's own heart was also the guy that's known as a life of a worshiper? He prayed, he worshiped, he was grateful, he was thankful, he poured out his praise to God. He sang these songs, and Psalms is filled with his songs. The whole book is a hymnal of praise and laments to God. Psalm 34, 1 through 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 66, 1 through 4, if you have in your Bible when you're looking at these, because remember it's a hymnal, it's a, it's a book of songs, it'll actually give instructions to the song leader. So this one says, here's the name of the song, How Awesome Are Your Deeds? And it says, To the Choir Master, a song, a psalm. And then it starts out, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praise to you. They sing praise to your name. The Psalms are filled with songs like these. David was serious about praising God. Was David's life perfect? Far from. Read the story. David's life is far from perfect. Even in the midst of being hunted, uh, by a king to be killed, even in the midst of an affair that led to the death of a child, even in the midst of suffering and difficulty, David worshipped God. David kept his focus on the Lord. And this is the key to worship, friends. Listen, when we worship, our eyes get off of us and get put on God. That is the place where thankfulness begins. Eyes off of me and my circumstance, because there's always something you can find here, right? But if I look up and I set my eyes on God and I begin to worship God, everything begins to change. It's different, friends, and this is why I say it is the key to a thankful life is praise and worship and remembering his benefits. So what David now shifts to is he's going to start naming some of those benefits some things his soul needs to remember. Because have you ever found in life that your soul can get down? That you can begin to be burdened? That things can feel heavy? There's a heaviness about life. Things can feel frustrating or, or fear-filled. And so David is telling us, oh, no, we're going to remember God's benefits. And so here's one of those benefits. Here's the first benefit he mentions. He says, life in relationship with God, here's a benefit is whole and healthy. Look at this verse. Who forgives all your iniquities or sin and who heals all your diseases. Now, let me break this down for a quick second. Remember one of the names of the devil, our enemy, is the accuser. You remember why he has that name? Is we see in Scripture, actually, that the devil goes into the throne room of God. For some reason, he has this access to do this. He goes in there and he says, do you see what that person's doing? Remember the story of Job? He said, do you remember Job? And, he, and he's doing this accusation. Well, he's doing that with you and I, too. He's saying, did you see what, they, what he just did? And he doesn't even need to make up lies. Because we give him so much fuel, right? We give him so much. He just has to point out the obvious. And God looks down, and we're told one of the names of God, the devil is the accuser, right? That's one of the names he's given. But remember, we also have someone who's called the advocate. Jesus is our advocate. The Holy Spirit is our advocate. So the accusation comes, look at that guy. He's a total failure. And Jesus looks and says, no, that one's... That one's been paid for. I purchased him with my blood on the cross, and now he's not that mess that he once was. His sins were once crimson. They were red. But now he's been made white as snow. 
Our sins have been forgiven because of Jesus, our advocate, who's in heaven right now advocating on your behalf. Isn't that good news, friends? Is that not a benefit that we can be thankful for this holiday season, that we have an advocate advocating before God on our behalf? And he goes on and he says something else. He says he heals all of our diseases. He heals our diseases. Now, I want you to remember something specifically here, friends. Who is David talking to? What is David talking to in this psalm when he says he heals our diseases? He's talking to his soul. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible is so full of Bible verses about Jesus healing our physical diseases that the reason when we read this heals our diseases as physical is because so much of Scripture is about that fact, that Jesus heals our physical diseases. But in this instance, that's not what we're talking about. David is referring to our disease of our soul. Now, what kind of soul diseases do we have? Well, we just mentioned one of them. Sin is certainly one of those diseases. But are there others? Yeah, things like fear and doubt and depression and anger and lust and hate and jealousy and pride and greed. And that list goes on and on. These are diseases of our soul that can be traced back to that infection of sin that mankind got in the Garden of Eden and has been wreaking havoc on our bodies and souls ever since. And David is reminding his soul that not only does God forgive our sin, but he actually heals the diseases of our soul. Isn't that good news for us today? Isn't that a benefit that we can be thankful for this holiday season, that God heals our soul? Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up their wounds. Isn't this an incredible gift of God that He cares about us mind, body, and soul? That He's holistic in His healing and care for our lives. What an incredible gift this is. It's one of the reasons we can give thanks today. God is in the business of healing our soul. Do you have one of these diseases in your soul that you find just kind of running rampant in your life? Friends, by coming to Jesus, we can receive healing for our soul. That's a great benefit. Let me share with you another benefit. Another benefit. Life in relationship with God, is meaningful. That's a great benefit. Our lives are meaningful. Look at verse 4 with me again. Who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. This first part, who redeems your life from the pit, in other translations it says he keeps your life from going to waste. He keeps your life from being tossed out, from being wasted. How many people on this earth are wasting their lives. How many people in our community are wasting their lives? They're pursuing things that in the long run will never count, will never add up. They're pursuing things that are temporary, pursuing things that pass away. They're pursuing things that once they achieve them and get a hold of them, they recognize it didn't do what it promised it would do. All their energy, all their life spent pursuing this thing that once they held on to it, they realized it wouldn't do what it promised it would do. The famous singer, Freddie Mercury, of the band Queen, before he died of AIDS, he said this, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. And that's the most bitter type of loneliness. Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving and ongoing relationship. See, he had everything. He achieved the dream. He was a rock star. And he had all of the fruit that came along with that. And none of it could possibly satisfy his hunger. See, the world has no hope for a meaningful life outside of Jesus Christ. Because money and material things and power and position and stuff can never fulfill the promises that it makes to us. But God, on the other hand, gives us a real, true, living purpose in this life. He gives our life meaning. 
He keeps our life from going to waste. How many of you would say that's a benefit? I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to make it to the end of my life, as Dad talked about last week, and look back over my life, as so many tragically do on their deathbed, look over their life and have real deep regrets about the way they live their life. I want to live my life in such a way, like David, it says, when David had accomplished all that God had for his life, then he died. That's the way I want to live my life. I want to live well to the very end with purpose and with meaning. And in Christ, we can do that, friends. Our lives don't go to waste. Verse 5 says, He satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Anyone could use some youth renewal today? Amen, right? We, th- this is something only God can do. He can satisfy us in every season of our life. He's not um, bound by what's the normal way things work. He can in every season give you rich satisfaction. That's uniquely something he's able to do. You see, here's the problem. We live in a world where God created all of these wonderful blessings for us to experience and that would help to satisfy us. But he never intended for them to satisfy us apart from him. Okay, so wonderful things like sex and food and work, all just to name a few, family, wonderful things. We try to find satisfaction in this stuff over here But apart from God, it can never satisfy. It never works right. It never does what it promises to do. But in Christ, all of these things I just mentioned can be redeemed and become fulfilling and become beautiful and actually satisfy longings that he designed in our bodies to have. But apart from Christ, you'll never be satisfied. Friends, I would say that's a wonderful benefit. Has anyone ever had an itch that you couldn't reach. I think my dad had one on his back for what, like 18 years, right? That you just couldn't deal with, ever. It's really unsatisfying to have something that you just can't satisfy, can't make go away. Friends, our lives in Christ, he satisfies us with good. Have you ever satisfied a hunger with something not good? I do this all the time. You're super hungry, so you're like, I'm going to go to McDonald's or Burger King, or Taco Bell, whatever it might be. And then you stop yourself, and then you're like, I'm not satisfied. Right? I'm not hungry anymore, but I am not satisfied. In Christ, friends, we are satisfied with good. With good. Isn't that a wonderful benefit? Band, you can come back up. Friends, I believe, and I have homework for you all, I believe we have to take seriously what God, I believe, is speaking to us today as a church. That we need to be mindful of living thankful and gratitude-filled lives. Is the mark of your life thanksgiving and gratitude? It's a serious question we need to be willing to ask ourselves. And so I have a homework assignment for you this week on Thanksgiving week that I think will be absolutely, could be transformational for your life and for your family. This week, would you, on paper, because it needs to happen on paper, would you together as a family, whether it's at the dinner table or sometime um, as a family, don't try to do it in one sitting, just add to it every day. Would you make a list as a family of the things that you are thankful for? Now, This should not be a four-item list, okay? This can be a rich list that every day you add something to. You come back from the grocery store and you go, I just remembered something else. Let's add it to the list. And I want you together as a family to begin building a list of the things you are thankful for. And on Thanksgiving Day, I want you to talk about this together as a family. I want you to say to each other, look at all of the things that we have to be thankful for. I know for my wife, Summer, as she worked on coming through a season of really heavy and dark depression, one of the tools that her counselor gave her that she used that has been such a blessing to our family was what she called her happy journal. And it was just a journal that she kept of her blessings. 
of things that made her happy. So that when life comes at you, you can remind yourself, no, no, yes, things are hard, but look at all that I have to be thankful for. If you would do this activity together as a family this week, I believe God would use this list that he would add to it and make it part of your regular habit as a family. How cool would it be as your kids grow up for them to come home from school and say, I've got something new to add to the list today. And you just keep a running list of all that you're thankful for. And then you go back to it and you remind yourself regularly of how good and how blessed by God we are as a people. I want to encourage you as your pastor, as your friend, this week, spend some time before the Lord and with your family. What are we thankful for? Now, let's stand together today. Let's worship. We have ways that you can uh, respond here today. One of the best things you can do as a way to be thankful is to be reminded that Jesus shed his body. It broke his body and his blood was shed for us. We could come and take communion. It really is an exercise of gratitude. You could come to the cross today and you could lay down areas of ingratitude. Things that you just know, man, this is a stronghold for me. You could come and leave that at the cross. If you're praying for somebody this holiday season, pray for them and then come and light a candle that represents that prayer. Let's, let's respond to the Lord now. Let's sing a song that's actually right taken out of this psalm together today. And let's just declare that we are going to bless the Lord in this place today.
If you're here today and you need healing for your soul, because you heard um, me describing those sicknesses of the soul, fear, anxiety, depression, greed, lust, hate, anger, if you feel, man, that's me, I'm struggling with some of these sicknesses of my soul. I believe the antidote for this is to praise. I believe the antidote, one of the many antidotes, is to really focus this morning on the Lord and His transforming power. So we're going to sing this song again. We're going to go all the way through it. We're going to take it from the top and go all the way through it a second time. And I really want you to focus your heart, focus your mind right now just on the Lord. Not on your struggle, not on your uh, sickness, not on the, the issue, but let's just praise God. In the midst, if you need someone to pray with you, you really have something. Man, I'm stuck. I'm just stuck in this. Joanne is in the back. I'll be up here in front. My dad will be up here in front. We'd love to pray with you. If you just need help this morning, let's just sing this song again. Let's really focus ourselves right now on the Lord, really believing that He heals all of our diseases. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name.
bless your name, God. You are good. Man, are you good to your people? Your generosity, your kindness, your mercy towards us. Oh, how wonderful it is to be your kids. How wonderful it is to God to be part of your family. How well you take care of us. How awesome are your ways. How wonderful are your works. We just, we just, Lord, want to tell you today we are thankful. And I pray, Lord, that we'll learn to sing this song of thankfulness. I pray that we will not be a people who are marked by the stuff that we are dissatisfied about, but we will be a people who constantly to ourselves, to our soul, to our spouse, to our kids, to our neighbors, to our community are saying, oh, how good it is to be part of the people of God. Oh, how blessed we are to be part of his family. Oh, how wonderful God's blessings in our life are. Lord, in a time where it's so easy to get caught up in the thinking of this and that and that I don't have enough or that, that this person needs to be in reason. Lord, in all this mess that we live in, let us not be shaken and blown by our culture, but let us stand firm on the rock of Jesus Christ, our foundation, because we have so much, God, to be grateful for. We have so much to be thankful for. I pray that this Thanksgiving would be more than just a holiday, but that it would be really a wake-up call for us, God, to begin to live our lives as the people of Thanksgiving. We are, God, a Thanksgiving people because of who you are and because of what you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to really go against our culture and for us to really live a life of gratitude. We are thankful. And we thank you in your perfect name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now go in peace. Serve the Lord. Be thankful and make a list because I believe it will change everything for you.